Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the 360 Experience podcast and my conversation today with Steve Dorfman. I'm your host, Tim Brahim, and I want to tell you a little bit about this episode that is upcoming. But before I do, I want to share with you a little bit about Steve. Steve was the uh, for seven years was the chief experience officer for Apex Home Loans in the greater Washington, D.C. area. Now, by chief experience officer, his focus was not only on creating a tremendous customer experience for the entire organization, but really diving into what that customer experience was and deriving feedback from the customers that would also include the real estate partners and other referral sources. And then also parlaying that into the experience that the organization would want their employees to have. So he he really was solely focused on creating systems of terrific customer experience, which I think is a very, very important topic in today's uh, mortgage landscape. Uh, Steve also brings the unique perspective of having been a salesman for quite some time. So uh, he was a salesman for Acura Auto uh, for many years and was a top performing sales executive. And he utilized customer care and proactive customer service as his main superpower, his unique selling proposition as a salesperson. If any of this sounds familiar and you know me, you know that this is a topic that I would uh, be excited to talk with Steve about because it's actually exactly what I did as a loan originator. I focused with my perfect loan process on providing proactive dynamic systems of customer service that generate repeat customer and uh, referral business on a on a very, very high level. So we're going to dive in deep. We're going to have a lot of synergy between the two of us. We're going to talk about how to recover an upset customer. We're going to talk about the importance of surveying your existing customers and not only taking the bad news, the the un uh, the unflattering reply, and learning from it, but also what you do when you get good news, because that's a ball that I often fumbled. Now that I reflect back on my experience, and 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 he and I are also going to talk about just some of our favorite customer experience processes and why they uh, why they worked so well and they were so proactive. So uh, be ready to take a lot of notes. This promises to be a great conversation. Before we get to our interaction, I just want to say thank you again for being a uh, subscriber to this show. Um, if you're not a subscriber, I would encourage you to, to do so. That's how I get great guests like Steve to be um, to sit with me and have a conversation. Um, comment on this and like us if you, uh, if you like this episode and forward this episode in particular to a friend, because it doesn't matter if you're in the mortgage business, real estate business, or any other vocation that involves sales. This one promises to be an episode that many people would like. And I would include in that list, all of your referral partners. So without further ado, my conversation with Steve Dorfman in the 360 experience. Hey, Steve. How are you, man? Welcome to the show. Thanks, Tim. You know, I've become a, a fan of the show, so it's, you know, it's fun to be in this seat. Thanks so much for, for listening to the episodes. You know, when I first started to get to know you here about, I don't know, seven, eight months ago, and you had told me that you've been listening to the show, it was, it was quite flattering, and I appreciate it. Well, it's easy because you're, you know, you've got amazing guests, and you're a, you're a really great interviewer. No pressure there. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, I, I try to you know, when I first started doing the show, I I thought of it more from the perspective of the interviewing. And then I realized that, no, this is more about having a conversation. I think that's when when things got a little bit better, which is what my intention is for today. And I, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm super excited for this conversation. And, and what you may or may not know about me, I don't know if we've ever had this discussion before, is that um, you know, like customer service and the customer experience is something that I'm probably more passionate about than anything. Um, are you familiar with the five love languages? Yes. So acts of service is absolutely by far my number one love language. I mean, I, I just, uh, I get like really pumped up and excited when I see that someone that gets it and provides tremendous customer care. Uh, so I have a feeling this is going to be a fun conversation for us to have today um, relating to the topic of how to take good care of customers and keep them coming back and generate referrals and and ambassadors of your product. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, 
you know, you're, I guess where I want to begin is that you're, you're passionate too about the subject matter of the customer experience and service. Um, and what I'm, what I'm guessing is that there has to be at least one, like, if not more than one hallmark experience for you as a customer that, um, really kind of ignited that feeling and that passion in you. So let's start there. Like, t tell us like, what's the foundation of you having this passion? Is there a specific experience that you've had that, that really kind of ignited that feeling inside of you? You know, it's it's interesting that you asked the question because I've I've been trying to um, examine that myself and figure out like where does that come from? Why why are some of us just wired that way? And you know, why do we develop this passion for it? Um, I I think there's probably something there if we peel the onion back further. But for now, what I know is that um, I had the opportunity to start out in the hospitality industry when I was 15 years old, hotels and restaurants, and I did that for the next eight years. And it just felt, it felt really good to be of service, you know, just um, to be thoughtful, to be anticipatory, to be a day maker. Um, it, it was just a, re a rewarding thing. So that's how I, I got my start, but I'm sure to your, to your question, it, it goes back further than that. And it's, and it's deeper than that. So I love that phraseology to be a day maker. Um, you know, I've been doing a lot of studying lately on the subject matter of purpose in one's life. Um, and there's a great, great quote. Well, there's many great quotes that I've uncovered, um, but one that stands out or a couple that stand out most fully to me are a quote from Marcus Aurelius um, from the Emperor's Handbook, uh, the diaries of, of the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius that's 2,000 years old. He said, we only get... We only get what we want if we help others get what they want. And to me, that just kind of is, that's very purposeful for me. Like it, taking the focus off of a self-serving initiative and putting it on helping another and trusting that the end result of that will be that you will get what you want in the long run. So let's let's dive in. You said, I, I've read on your website that the secret to driving market share is to create consistently remarkable customer service. Um, how does one go about doing that? Like, what's the formula for like laying out a plan in your mind to consistently provide remarkable customer service? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of co companies claim that that's what they're doing. Right. And and as a customer of those companies, we, we end up with the feeling of like, well, that felt like lip service because that's not really been my experience as a customer. So the, the fact that you, that you do have to be intentional about it and have processes in place uh, is just key. It doesn't work without that. And it has to be socialized. It has to be part of the culture. It has to be hired for, right? I mean, if we're going to have people on the front line and they're not people people, then, uh, you know, we're making a huge mistake there. And then, uh, the, you know, the people that are behind the scenes um, are just as critical. You know, if you're not if you're not directly supporting the customer experience, you're supporting someone who's supporting the customer experience. So everybody plays a part. Um, these are all puzzle pieces. But if I were to put a formula, uh, a formula on it, and you know the things that that we can start to focus on in a simplistic way, it's uh, based on some research out of Gallup, and I learned this by reading um, "First Break All the Rules" by Marcus Buckingham. And it, there's a part in there which I wasn't expecting. It was just a gem. I found it to be a gem when when I uh, when I came across this part. Um, they found that there are four things that if we deliver on these consistently and thoughtfully, are powerful enough to turn a prospect into an advocate. And notice I said prospect, right? Not even a client into an advocate, but a prospect. So even if that person doesn't end up, um, uh, you know, doing business with you today. Or um, you know, for whatever reason, um, they could still become an advocate for you. So the the four things are accuracy, availability, partnership, and advice and learning. So if if, if I were to unpack that a little bit, you know, the first two levels are accuracy and availability, right? So those are pretty easy to wrap our heads around. Accuracy, look, we want to make sure we're paying attention to detail. That's important to people, right? Um, availability, uh, we need to be responsive. We can't, we can't let an email go unanswered for, you know, three days. We can't always let calls go to voicemail, if we're, especially, if, you know, if we're a, if we're a brick and mortar business, we've got to have somebody answering the phone. Um, so that's the accuracy and availability part. Now I don't spend much time talking about those because they're just table stakes, 
right? Like nobody's going to be wowed necessarily by those two things, but they're important because they made the list and there's only four things, but they're just table stakes. So that, so um, where it gets really interesting and where we get to get be creative in our approach and really uh, distinguish ourselves amongst our competition are levels three and four partnership and advice and learning. So partnership is, it's really just this, it's just this thing we're wanting to create of being on the same side as our customer, right? Like we're on the same side of the table. It's not you on that side of the table and me on this side of the table. And, um, you know, coming at it from that approach, like I'm sitting side by side with you. I'm, I'm here to guide you. I'm your partner through this journey. If everything that we say and do demonstrates partnership, and by the way, this includes internal partnerships. So the way that we talk about our team, the way that we talk about other departments, we have to do that in a way that's demonstrating partnership. And, um, and that's how we win in that realm. And then the highest level is advice and learning. So if we can be seen as the expert, if somebody walks away from an interaction with us feeling like, wow, I don't think I would have learned that from anybody else at any other company. I got really lucky to meet this individual because they're presenting this in such a way that I'm actually learning something. I'm becoming educated. They're presenting it in such a way. It's not over my head there. I know they do this every day and they could be speaking in jargon and they could get really technical about this stuff, but they're explaining it in a way that I get it. And so I'm learning something and I'm grateful for that. So uh, these are all the things that if we focus on them can, can, can just be needle movers in a very, very big way. It's beautifully articulated. I, I, I remember a long time ago, I heard Barry Habib say um, that the question you ultimately want your customer to ask is, what am I going to miss out on if I don't work with him or her? And, and I think that's a really powerful question. Um, it struck me as being a very powerful question that you want to evoke in the individual that you're consulting with or courting as a prospect, if you will, or trying to connect with. Uh, and that can only come from having taught them something, right? Like, I mean, that's the natural byproduct of someone having learned something from you is that you're then going to say, well, what am I, what else do I not know that this person might be able to bring to me in the way of value that I would be missing out on if I didn't work with him or her. But, but it starts with that learning part that you're talking about. I, I also want to interesting terminology of partnership there. I, I've been examining that word quite a bit lately. Um, there are certain words that loan originators throw around in particular, and I'm sure salespeople in, in all vocations do, like loyalty, partnership, et cetera. And, and you know, partnership is one that I think gets thrown around really loosely, but I'm not so sure that most people really take two steps back and analyze what is a partnership? I mean, what's the definition of a true partnership? Um, so I'd actually like to just start by asking you if you've ever pondered that and what your definition of partnership is, and then I can maybe kind of come in after that and share what mine is. Yeah, I, I think it just comes down to how we're leaving our customers feeling. Um, you know, if we're in partnership with somebody, then we have their best interest at heart and we're demonstrating that. So again, it's I go back to what I said earlier about lots of companies paying lip service to this kind of thing. You know, we can't, we, we can't use these words in our unique selling proposition when we're first meeting with somebody, unless we're going to demonstrate it. So we've got to, we've got to do things that, uh, that demonstrate it again, both internally and externally. Um, and it, we have to leave people feeling uh, like two things. One, uh, I felt completely taken care of and two, wow, those guys thought of everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like those are, those are great, goals to go for to to help demonstrate partnership um you know if i distill it all it just comes down to they're on my side they're on my side i'll give you i'll give you something uh fun from the restaurant business i i read i don't know if you've read this one tim uh, setting the table by danny meyer no I've, I've not in fact there's a really good chance that you could ask me about just about any business book and my answer would be no i've not i don't really read business books but i'm fascinated <laughs> to hear about this one tell, tell yeah, me about I it i think i did this one on audio um and it's uh, read by the author which is always great so, so danny meyer is a famous restaurateur out of new york city he's uh he's got everything from fine dining all the way down to shake shack he's the guy that founded shake shack um, he's got restaurants inside the Museum of Modern Art. He's got Gramercy Tavern, Blue Smoke, all these all these uh, famous New York City restaurants. And um, 
he found, he saw an opportunity, he and his staff, staff saw an opportunity to demonstrate partnership in this way. So in New York City, when you've got a famous uh, popular restaurant, you're booked well in advance with reservations. It's tough for people to get them. And you can come from a cocky place if that's who you are as a brand. Um, and you never, of course, want the customer to feel that. Um, but it happens, right? So um, what they began to do when people would call for reservation and the time they wanted wasn't available, the host uh, or hostess would say something like this. They would say, you know, ideally, I, I know that you want to come in on on Friday at 730. And currently, um, you know, the, the only opening we have for a part of your size is at 9 p.m. And I know that's, you know, that's not exactly what you were looking for. But I'll tell you what, if you can give me a window of time that would work for you and your party, then um, I'll put it in my system so that you're notified in case there is a cancellation. And you know what? I'll be rooting for a cancellation. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So isn't that neat? It's just, you know, it's just some, some simple scripting that, you know, is easy to teach to frontline staff, but uh, where have you ever gotten that? Right. Yeah. That's I, I, that last part is the key part, right? Like I'll be rooting for there to be a cancellation that leaves that evokes the feeling in me of someone being on my side. And I think there's a lot of little things that I mean, my definition of partnership is that I am if I'm somebody's partner, I'm providing equal, if not more value to them than I can get in uh, that I'm receiving in return and that I am thinking about them and their well-being and and, and in a proactive way, like I'm, I'm conscious about them as a human being and their needs. You know, so it's like right now, a lot of originators have a lot of pre-approved borrowers. Um, people over the last 18 to 24 months that have applied for a loan um, that have been unfortunately boxed out of the market. There's not enough inventory. The affordability is a problem with rates having gone up. This is a time, I mean, that's that's annuity income or that's future income that's sitting there so long as you nurture that relationship, so long as you forge a true partnership. But I think that originators oftentimes get a little bit myopic in that they are solely focused on the subject matter of mortgage interest rates and real estate financing. Um, and I'd love to get your feelings on this because I think that partnership and loyalty and true connection and relationships um, are or more of a byproduct, as you said, about how you make the person feel um, and, and who you're bringing to the relationship more so than what you're bringing to the relationship. Like what, who am I in this connective relationship with this person? And, and that's, that's illustrated quite well by this last example you gave. I mean, who that hostess or host was in that script was somebody who actually cared about you and is trying to help you, which evokes that feeling and that and that that forging of a connection. So, t tell me a little bit more. Like, just spitball on here. I'll make. Does that does that resonate for you? And what would you share in, in response to that? Yeah, it's it's you know how are we coming into the situation? I I, I love your definition of partnership and. It, it it really is the mindset of like, how are we coming into this initial conversation with a prospect and every conversation thereafter? Are we coming from a place of um, maybe it's scarcity right now? Maybe it's, uh, um, you know, maybe it's you're trying to hit a unit bonus for the for the month or, you know, whatever it may be. If it's if it's self-serving, then that's the place we're going to be coming from. If instead we're coming from a place of I'm about to meet with a future friend. I'm about to meet with somebody who is going to become a referral source for me because they're going to be so wowed by the experience, the seamless experience that my team and I deliver that not only are they going to become loyal to us, but um, they're going to be preconditioned to like want to go out of their way to refer others to us. And how am I going to do that? I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to want for them what I would want for myself or any family member. I had, um, I had a, a, a doctor's appointment recently. And the doctor was recommending uh, uh, a particular medication. My my cholesterol is like borderline. And he's like, you know, you don't need it right now. But, you know, I'm going to recommend you go on a statin. It's not required. But, you know, here are the reasons why why it's, you know, it's a good idea. We talked it through. And in the end, I said, I said, Doc, you know, what would you do if you were me? And he goes, well, I've been on one since I was 22 because I know what I know. <laughs> and so I, so I thought to myself, why didn't you lead with that? You know, because that's what we really want to know. Like, would you do this for yourself? 
right? Is this the product? If you were me, is this the product you would put yourself in? If I were your brother, sister, mother, father, you know, a loved one. Um, and, and so I think that's, you know, that's a smart way to uh, approach it and maybe even ar- ar- articulate it at some point in the conversation. If you're feeling, um, if you're feeling that that's not going to be a contrived thing to say, and it feels natural and authentic, then I think it's maybe a good thing to go there. Yeah. I mean, I used to, when reviewing uh, the numbers with my clients, breaking down three or four different loan options in a spreadsheet, uh, after we were done having our dialogue, I would say, now, listen, whether it be with me or somebody else that does what I do for a living, I I recommend, based upon our interactions and what you've shared is important to me and putting myself in your shoes, I recommend this five-year fixed rate mortgage at no points. So I'm, I'm giving advice. I'm not being pushy. I'm giving it from a place of neutrality. I think that that self-serving uh, component that you you talked about is is very important. I think that when when we are thinking of ourselves and coming from that scarcity place that you referenced, um, people can feel that. Um, make no mistake about it. Um, the, the, the energy that the words that come out of our mouth ride on are an energy of looking after me rather than looking after you. Um, and, and no scripting in the world can change that energy. Um, people feel it. And, and I, I think that if you can seek to come from a detached place in sales and truly come from a place of service, um, I'm here to help. And that is it. Whether you go with me or not, my job is to help. I think you're an infinitely more successful salesperson in the end because people will feel uh, the authenticity and and then they'll lower their guard and they'll connect with you because they won't feel like they have to be on the lookout for what is the the sneaky little pitch that I'm getting delivered here that isn't going to serve my best interests. Um, so let's let's kind of continue down this path so uh we have a a very good mutual friend to say the least and craig strent who's the head of faculty for the loan atlas and a longtime friend and client of mine and who you used to work alongside at apex home loans and when you came aboard at apex as a chief experience officer i presume that uh one of the first things that you did was assess the landscape and try to figure out um, how the needle could be moved in a positive direction with the customer experience, uh, both the mortgage customer experience and the employee customer experience, I believe. Um, So what's the process that you went through to evaluate and then put things into place that would create a differentiation in what people were experiencing from the past versus now? And and let's try to tie this into, like if I'm a loan originator or a real estate agent or anybody else that's in sales listening to this conversation, I'm, I'm hoping that they're getting a, a you know, an idea or pointed in the right direction of what they need to do to do that assessment and to start to put some things into place. And and maybe you can, I know I'm throwing a lot at you, so sorry. And hopefully you can remember all this. If not, maybe I'll be able to remember. Um, wh- what are some just like a couple of easy to implement things that you think make a difference too in, the, in that process? Yeah, well, you know, fundamentally, we have to create a safe space for our employees and our, and our customers to, you um, be able to provide feedback. So one of the things, there's a few mistakes that we make in that, in that uh, area of feedback. One is, um, you know, how, uh, how are we engaging with people to get open, honest feedback? Um, So looking at the delivery system, whether we're talking about, uh, you know, surveying employees, meeting with people, having conversations, um, and then, you know, how are we reaching out to our customers and asking them for feedback when and how are we doing that are we doing it in a way that um you know demonstrates to them that it's a worthwhile investment uh, or does it just feel like one more survey in my inbox cuz i just i've already gotten 3 this week from the hotel and the rental car place and the you know the this and the that and like you know we we're, we're bombarded with these types of things so we have to be really thoughtful about how do we stand out in our request for feedback um, and we have to um, we have to follow through on um, those conversations. So at the very least, we thank we thank people for the feedback. And if we take it to the extreme, then we keep them, you know, in that in that spirit of partnership, we keep them in the loop. Like here's what you shared with me, um, and and here are some ideas I have about how we can remedy that. Or by the way, it doesn't have to be just you know. Um, the negative stuff. 
it, it, it one of the one of the one of the biggest mistakes I, I, I see companies making is they focus heavily on the negative stuff. And you know, the first thing that happens when a bad survey comes in is they share it with the team and they want to place blame instead of looking at it like lessons learned, like we clearly dropped the ball here in the eyes of the customer. Perception is reality. It might not be quote the truth of what really happened, but it's how we left them feeling, right? And I said earlier, like we want to leave people feeling those two things completely taken care of. And as if we thought of everything and if they didn't feel that, and that's what they're expressing to us, then we've got to make it clear that that's not okay. And here's what we're doing to remedy it. And, um, and, and, you know, to the extent that they're willing, have them involved in, in expanding on the feedback. Now, flip side of that coin, when somebody provides positive feedback, um, which thankfully, you know, in my experience is happening more often than the other, uh, than the negative, you know, we can't rest on that either. First of all, we have to, we have to thank them for participating, let them know that they made our day. Um, and, and, and then what we need to do is not become numb to these things that we're doing really well. Um, we need to socialize that among the team. Like, Here's something that we've heard over and over. This is a trend. We're hearing this from customers. So even if they don't thank you, like in your everyday conversations with them, this is what they're saying. And we're hearing it enough to know that it matters. So not only how can we continue to do that on a consistent basis, but like, how can we up-level it? How can we take it even further to really wow people? So it starts with discovery, Tim. That's the short answer to your question of like, where do you even begin? Um, it's the willingness to like know the truth of what's happening and not bury our heads in the sand. So we have to go into it with a willingness to, um, you know, hear the good along with the bad and, um, and also the willingness to do something with the information because people are used to providing information, then nothing happens with it. So that, that's, that's, by the way, that's worse than having asked for the information in the first place. You know, it's better to not, it's better to not ask. <laughs> if you're not going to do anything with it. So what I'm hearing you say is initially, like if I'm an originator right now, listening to this conversation or real estate agent, like put together a thoughtful uh, survey, reach out to the client. I'm, I'm going to elaborate a little and say that maybe uh, you send out a video or a voice broadcast in advance saying, you know, hey, I'm hoping that you can do me a really big favor. I'm looking to improve on the quality of the experience that you have when you work with me. And you were kind enough to work with us in the past. And I'm going to send you a short survey. If you don't mind taking just a couple of minutes to provide feedback, uh, my team and I will then meet on that and and really look to improve our platform. So the next time you work with us, the experience is even better than the first time around. Um, like a little heads up, little thoughtful video, then you send out some kind of a thoughtful survey. Um, and then what I'm hearing is that whether it's good news or bad news, both of them need to be addressed. The person needs to be thanked for uh, for having responded. So it's not going on deaf ears. Um, and maybe you're even um, reporting out to them the the results of their feedback. So we heard what you said, and here are some things that we have determined as a team that we're gonna to do to ensure that that never happens again, and we have you to thank for that. So then that makes that person feel like they're co-authoring your, your up-leveling of, of your experience platform as a result of participating, and it, and it makes them feel like their, their feedback didn't fall upon deaf ears. But I think that the, the biggest thing that I'm hearing in all of this that I think I've missed is what I'm hearing is you're rewarding, you're wanting to use this opportunity to reward and reinforce good behavior or good practices, right? So when the person is providing positive feedback uh, in a survey, don't drop the ball on making sure that you go to the person who provided that service and say, hey, look at what so-and-so said, thank you great job, which is going to motivate that person to want to do that again and again and again, and maybe even give them some licensing to think more creatively as to how they can up level it. Is that a, is that a fair summary? It's perfect. And, you know, one of the things that we, uh, that we used to ask because we wanted to, we, we wanted to relay these kudos to specific members of the team. We would ask the question, is there someone on the team who deserves special recognition for their efforts? And 
you know, when you when you have uh, teams of people that are just really expert in their in in, in their realm, whether they're a processor or um, you know a, a loan officer assistant, whatever the position may be, um, when they've made a positive impact on the borrower, they they want to the borrower wants to wants to name names, right? And so we actually set up a we we set up a um, a process that would get that back into the hands of the entire team. Um, most of these survey platforms are set up in such a way that survey results only come back to branch manager and 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 sometimes a loan officer, but that's it. it. Doesn't go any further than that. And we're not so good as a as a group in this industry, probably in almost any industry, of sharing the positive feedback with the people who need to hear it. We're really good at um, you know waving a piece of paper around and saying, "Look what just came in." How, you know, we dropped the ball. Who's responsible here? Right. But we're not so good at the at the uh, at the other at the other, which is sharing the positive feedback. So, um, you know, that's that's really critical. I I would I would onboard uh, processors who would say, oh, my gosh, that's so cool that you do that, because at my last company, the only time I ever saw a survey was when there was a problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how deflating and defeating is that if you're if you're in operations and that's and that's all that's all you're ever seeing and getting now. If I could simplify this process um, and give people something actionable to use, um, I would say it's it's the net promoter score system of um, of asking for feedback because it's it's proven to tie directly to customer loyalty. And uh, as soon as I say the question, you're going to recognize it immediately if you've never heard of the net promoter score system, because you've been asked this question dozens of times as a customer of many different entities. The question is, on a scale of zero to 10, how likely is it you'd recommend us to a friend or a colleague? Or you can you can change that piece a little bit, friend or relative is what we used to say um, for the mortgage business. But uh, where it gets really interesting is, um, you know, the number that they choose between zero and 10 is very telling because when they answer with a nine or a 10, what the evidence has shown um, and the research shows, that person's uh, labeled a promoter. So, they're not just likely to return, they're likely to refer. They're predisposed um, to be, become a referral source. They're responsible for 80 to 90% of the referrals that come in. Mm. Now this applies to referral partners as well, right? So it's not just borrowers, it's anybody who's a referral source. If they can answer that with a nine or a 10, that group of people are responsible for 80 to 90% of the referrals that are gonna come in. When somebody answers the question with a seven or an eight, they're a passive, that's the label that they're given. Um, and to simplify that, it means that uh, th they're just in this sort of like gray zone of where they won't just leave you for something better. They'll leave you for something different. Mm. And then there's the zeros to sixes, which they're called the detractors. This is a super, a super dangerous group because um, they're, they weren't left feeling good at all. And they're now predisposed to spread negative word of mouth. And, um, and, you know, that, that happens on and offline, right? So, um, look, we could bury our heads in the sand and not ask these types of questions and hope for the best and cross our fingers, or we can like, you know, make it a safe space for people to, to um, provide their feedback. Now there's a follow-up question to what's, what I just said was the ultimate question. There's a book by that name, the ultimate question. Um, so I'll say it again, on a scale of zero to 10, how likely is it you'd recommend us to a friend or colleague or friend or relative? The follow-up to that is, what's their primary reason for the score you just chose? What I love about that is it's like saying to somebody, sounds like there's a story there. Regardless of whether they gave you a two or a six or a 10, you're asking what's their primary reason you chose that number because they're gonna reveal what mattered most to them, what stood out most to them, what's what's wiring them, predisposing them now to become a, a detractor or a passive or a promoter. So what are some of the things, just list off a couple that you recall seeing as the reasons that someone was a detractor? What are the what are the common repetitive things that you saw? Um, one of the most common mm -hmm. is um, I, I had to reach out to my, to my team to know where things were at. They, mm -hmm. you know, they weren't, they weren't providing proactive status updates. Um, 
this was really uncommon at our at Apex because you know we we had a system in place for proactively communicating communicating status updates. But we, you know, when when everything when the boom hit in 2020, 2021 during COVID, uh, and we knew that refis were going to take two, three times longer than they normally would, we had to we had to um, be proactive about that and say, okay, how are we going to get ahead of this? How are we, how are we going to, how are we going to let borrowers know that like no news isn't necessarily bad news. This is just like expectation setting. So, Mm -hmm. you know, we got really good at um, crafting some scripting that was both conversational, but um, you know, a lot of it were leaning, leaning on email updates for this and text updates. Uh, if they were opted in for that, but it was, you know, it was just being really clear about, um, you know, where we're at, what we might need from you at this stage, what to expect next, why there might be a delay, um, you know, and and be being realistic and under promising and how long this thing is going to take from the very start, like, you know, letting people know, like, you're at no risk here because um, we've locked in your rate. And if, if, if it happens to expire, that's going to be on us. We're covering that, but um, we're doing everything in our power to make sure that you close in this amount of time. And we would, um, we would under promise on that amount of time, whatever that, whatever that time was um, at that moment in time, right. You know, based on, uh, based on loan volume, based on staff size to support the loan volume, all of it. Right. Uh, uh, can I can I share a quick story about under promising and over delivering? Sure, sure. Um, it's it's just one of these tenets of you know delivering a, a, an incredible uh, borrower experience, and we salespeople especially um, just tend to fall into the over promising part. And I think in part it comes from a place of um, it comes from a place of maybe scarcity, or it comes from a place of competitiveness, like you're worried that somebody else, that they're going to talk to somebody else who gives them a better answer to their question. And we know that that person is probably over-promising in whatever it is, if it's a timeline, if it's a, a product, whatever it may be. Um, way back in the mid nineties, I started selling cars. And by 2000, I was at Acura and, it, and, in, and around, around the year 2000, the Acura MDX was released. And it was, uh, it was the first time Acura was coming out with an SUV. And there was a waiting list. Everybody wanted this thing. It was hot. It wasn't being discounted. In fact, a lot of dealerships were warning it above list price. And the wait was as long as eight months. So we had to be really clear about that. And what I heard some of my colleagues telling customers was, um, and, and giving ranges is good too. That's a, that's a good little trick. Um, but I would hear colleagues saying, uh, based on based on the number of units we're receiving and the people who've already placed their deposit, um, we expect your vehicle to arrive in eight to nine months, right? Uh, and so let's say that puts us into the month of September, right? Now, what I heard a lot of my colleagues saying is they would follow it up immediately by saying, but we like to under promise and over deliver. So it might be here sooner. It might be here in like July or August. Now you've reset the expectation. <laughs> Yeah, and it's like blew it. you totally, yeah, you, you totally just, yeah, you just ruined it. Um, so anyway, I just, I think that's just one of those. It's a little thing, but it's such a big thing. Well, you know? okay, so I have a, a lot of comments that I want to hit on here real quick because you said a bunch of really important stuff. So, first of all, you know, the to set up the intentional under promise and over deliver is an art in many ways, um, and it and it's an art that is backed by having a level of security within oneself. It is from a place of insecurity, as you pointed out, that we unfortunately are prone to over-promising and under-delivering because we're worried about somebody else, you know, having said something more attractive or just the customer, oftentimes just assume what the customer's expectation is. So an example of that would be this, when it starts to get smoking busy and you're taking, you know, three days in underwriting and your real estate agent is used to you getting a 24 hour turn time because over the last couple of years, it's been you know relatively slow. You know, you're better off to just say, you know, we're running, I just want to get out in front of this and let you know we're running about five days right now in underwriting. Um, don't worry if you don't hear from us, it's not because there's anything wrong. Cause that's another thing is that when you, 
when you don't have this kind of conversation and then there's radio silence, that's like just giving them a sentence fragment that says, I haven't heard from them because dot, dot, dot. And they're going to fill it in with all the worst case scenarios because that's where our mind goes because there's something wrong because the appraisal didn't come in because, you know, they've forgotten about me. I mean, you know, but if you get out proactively to your point in front of it and say, hey, listen, it's, it's going to be five days. You're probably not going to hear from us for five days, even though it's only taking three days. Okay. Now I come back three days later and say, hey, guess what? I got some great news. We were able to get this file made a priority because you're a great partner of ours. And we we're able to get this loan approved in three days. I'm happy we we're able to come in two days early. I mean, that's the smart way. And it takes security and confidence to intentionally set up uh, the under promise and over deliver. Um, so be super mindful of that. Everyone listening, you know, whether you're in real estate or, or, or lending or whatever. Um, You'd rather be a hero than a zero. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's interesting too, that you had said, um, when I had asked you the question, you know, what's, what's the one thing that pops to mind of, of, um, let's see, I forgot it was a, as a detractor. And, and the first place that you went to was communication. That doesn't surprise me, uh, but it wasn't rate and it wasn't fees. It was communication. I mean, people like to get clear, honest, upfront communication. And a lot of originators run from the bad news. So when you go back to the survey, um, I think that a lot of people don't do surveys because they're afraid of what's going to come back. Um, and they're not going to know what to do with that quote unquote negative information. But I love the juxtaposition that, and spin that you put on it, which is this is actually just an opportunity for learning and growth. This is extremely valuable feedback. It, you know, the negative feedback that I get Oh, by the way, is there, whether you're looking at her or not, the person's feeling it. So you might as well know it. So you have an opportunity to turn around and thank them and, and, and let them know you appreciate the feedback and you're going to take that information and do some positive things with it. So there's a whole bunch of gold in what you shared there, Steve. I, I really appreciate you going there. Do you want to comment on anything like that before I pivot to another question? I'll just say that when you look at specific comments from borrowers, whether whether it's things that they've written on a feedback form, a survey, or if it's something that they've told you co conversationally, um, we used to play with this. We would we would we would put them up on the screen at a sales meeting. You know, here's what some, and this back this goes back to the days when people were handwriting comments on a survey form that was delivered to closing table. Right? Uh, this is this is before automation. Um, we would, you know, we'd throw, uh, we'd throw a picture of that up on the, on the big screen in the PowerPoint at a sales meeting. And we would just play a little game. Like, what are they pointing to? And Tim, 10 times out of 10, they were pointing to either accuracy, availability, partnership, or advice and learning. Mm. So I, I get chills when I say it, because it's like, it's, it's the, it is the, if there was a magic formula on what matters to people, like these are the four things. This is when you read between the lines or um, or just look at their specific, if they just said like team, the team was great, great experience. If it's something vague like that, then that's not much to sink your teeth into. But when people get specific about what made it a great experience, you can you can always, always tie their comments back to those four things, one, one or more of those four things. That's really, really great feedback because I used to, so I was really good about doing a, so back in the day, you know, I would send a one page survey to the closing agent and say, Hey, when they're signing their loan documents, please ask them to fill this out and send it back to me. Okay. And we'd get most of them back. And it was, you know, right on a scale of one to five type questions. And I would very commonly because of our perfect loan process and how really dialed in we were as a team and how proactive we were, I would get like almost all fives. And and I would say to the client when I would review it with them, I would say, hey, just thank you so much for taking the time to fill this out. And in my post post closing interview, and I'd say, you know, I, I, I appreciate very much that you gave us, you know, all fives on all these questions, but I'm hoping that you could take a moment to think about just one thing that you wish it were different. But see, that's the mistake, right? What I'm doing is I'm trying to take a positive survey and find a negative so I can look for room for improvement which I still think is admirable that I did that and it would send a very important message to that person that I am really looking to get better. But the big miss and what I'm hearing is to just simply ask why, what, what was it about your experience that made you give us all five? So I could get reinforced feedback to give to my team and say, okay, let's keep doing this more. And what can we do creatively even to further this just a little bit more to make it even better? So that's a huge takeaway and I appreciate that. Now, um, we've talked about being proactive. Um, 
I love it so much as a customer when, and I can cite so many examples of when I am, my needs are predicted and advanced. Okay. Like they're like, it's like they're one step ahead of me. And I, and I try and I think do a really good job of that in my profession. So like in our leadership 360 coaching retreats, like I, we're actively as a team thinking about where are they right now? What's happening in their life? What can we do to meet their needs? What can we do to, to give them something they didn't even know that they needed or wanted? But as soon as you gave it to them, they're like, wow, this is exactly what I needed. Um, so so the, the question is around the idea of anticipating needs um, versus meeting needs. And I think there is a difference, right? And I think I've heard you say that before, that it's not just about meeting needs, it's about anticipating those needs. Tell us a little bit about how to go about doing that. Maybe you can give us an example of that. Yeah, it's an important distinction because, you know, meeting needs is reactive, right? And anticipating needs is proactive. Like, you know, who do we want to be? Um, we, we do this every day. Why shouldn't we be able to anticipate their needs? This ain't our first rodeo. Like we, we're experts in this realm. Um, shame on us if we're not anticipating their needs. Like we've been through it thousands of times before. Um, and so we, again, we leave people with that feeling of, wow, I felt completely taken care of and they thought of everything. When you can do somebody's critical thinking for them, it takes a load off. Yeah. Right. Like we have to remember that th they don't, they don't do this every day. We do. I think, um, it, I think if I can just interject for a second, it, it takes a load off, but I think it's actually deeper than that in that if you can start anticipating my needs and start giving me needs that, you know, granting needs or, or, or providing needs that I didn't know I had, it lowers my guard. I surrender to you. I start trusting you. Yes. And I think that's I love, a key component to it. I love that. I love that. And if you think about the experiences that you've had as a customer anywhere, like it's rare. It's rare that somebody demonstrates that kind of thing. In fact, it's usually the opposite. Like one of the things that comes to mind is you go into a doctor's office and it's your first your first time visiting this particular doctor, specialist maybe, and they hand you a clipboard full of forms, right? Like in 2024, how could, how could you have not sent me a link so that it could have done this in advance? Is there a way you could have gotten this information from a portal? Like, um, you know, uh, there, there are things that, and by the way, they give you a form that like the boxes aren't even big enough to fill in your information, right? Like, come on. Yeah, totally. And that's, that's for decades, that's been the case. Like, they're not just not meeting a need. They're, you know, I mean, they're not just not anticipating need. They're not even meeting a need. Uh, a funny, a funny little um, thing that I that I uh, that I learned about, um, and this is after many years after my days in the car business. But um, you know, the first manufacturer to offer a production automobile to the public was the Benz uh, Corporation back in the late 1800s. It would be 70 or 80 years before cup holders made their way into cars, right? <laughs> like. That's, you know, that's, that's the epitome of like eventually meeting a need. And that's what we tend to see. Like we, we tend, we tend to see that um, sometimes best case. Right. And so if we can get good at anticipating people's needs, like the status updates, that's, that's a, that's a really big one. Cause like you said, communication is key and that's, you know, that that's where um, people are either feeling it or they're not. So if we can anticipate their need, their desire to know, like, where am I at right now? And this goes to our referral partners as well, especially realtors, of course, you know, they need to know. And and uh, and so they were looped in in an automated way to these status updates. They were always kept in the loop and they appreciated it and they were impressed by it. And then you you start to up level it. You start to you start to say, OK, how can I say all these same things with less words? Right. Because we know that people only have so much of an attention span. How can we offer this in a uh, in a way that it gets texted to them? It's not just another email, but they can engage by clicking on the text to expand something further. And it's tailored to them, by the way, you know, because they could be a purchase or they could be refinanced. They could be e-signing or wet signing. Like, let's be you know, let's let's be specific in the information that we're that we're providing. Let's make it visual. We had a 
we had a colorful uh, progress arch that would um, that would show them exactly where they're at in the process. And it would be grayed out until the, until a step was completed and then it would come alive with color. So we know that, you know, half of humans are visual learners, right? So that was a way to, to sort of bring this thing to life and anticipate that need of like, just wanting to know, like, where do I stand? Where are we at? Where's my loan? What's next? What do you need from me? Right. So uh, I, I've, I've felt for a long time that the easiest pathway to anticipating someone's needs is to pay very close attention to where you're being reactive, because that's your clue as to where you're not being proactive. So somebody asks you for status on something. So I used to have a rule with my team when I first implemented the per perfect loan process, which is a highly proactive step by step process. Of those that are listening that are Loan Atlas members, I mean, you should be watching all of those trainings and downloading the PLP and starting to integrate it in your business because it was the major key to my success as an originator because that is what creates repeat and, re and referral businesses is, is providing that experience when you have that person as a captive audience. But my rule with my team was very simple. If, if I am hearing from a borrower or a referral partner asking me, for status, asking me a question, all that is is an indication as to where we're not being proactive enough in our system. We're not anticipating their needs. Ideally, they have no questions for us in the most perfected form of, of a service platform. They have no questions because we're answering their questions before they can even think to have them. That's when at the end, you're like, shit, I can't even think of anything that I would have done differently or wanted differently because this was absolutely fantastic. So. If you're willing to indulge me, I don't mean to put you on the spot, I think it'd be kind of fun to you guys that are passionate about service to play a little game. And it would be to go back and forth and just, you know, quick hit, first thing that comes to mind of an example of when you were either a part of a process that was proactive and predicted the need, or you were the c customer that experienced your need being predicted. Are you willing to play that little game with me? Sure. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and start. I'll pick a, a, a simple one. Um, I started to realize that my high D, so type A personality borrowers as an originator that were highly successful would get frustrated when it came time to sign docs because they didn't want to have to go to the title company or to the escrow office and sign their documents at three o'clock in the afternoon and sit in the lobby and take two hours out of their day to do it because they wanted to be at the office making more money. So I said, huh, all right, let's start using a mobile notary. And I hired a mobile notary and put a mobile notary on my team and all closings from that point forward would always happen with my mobile notary. And I would say to them, listen, I know how valuable your time is. I don't want you to have to sit in the title office. I'm going to have the doc signer come to your office or to your home in the evening. You pick the time that's convenient for you. That was a huge game changer. Over to you. Okay. When I was new at Apex um, and I mentioned how the, the survey was being delivered at the closing table, one of the things that we were running into was uh, the way we were putting that in the hands of the settlement office. Like, you know, were they, it was in the packet, but like, were they putting it in front of the borrower? Or were they just tossing in the trash can? And if they were putting it in the borrower, what were the words that were coming out of their mouth? Right. And you know, if, if we worked with 30 different uh, settlement companies, then there were probably 30 different ways this was happening, right? So what we decided to do was invite our settlement partners in for a customer experience workshop. We had a great turnout and uh, it was something that I led and just shared, you know, a list of best practices. Like these are the you know, these are the pitfalls to avoid if you want to deliver great, a great customer experience. And, um, you know, we, we, we would just give examples and a lot of the stuff that you and I have been talking about here, Tim. And um, they were so wowed by it that by the end to make that request of like, you know, Hey, by the way, when it comes time to deliver that paper survey at the table, um, here's what we'd love for you and your team to be saying about it so that we would get more engagement mm -hmm. with it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's go. that's a great one. So you 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 scripted them as to how to deliver it and to get it filled out from an authentic place is what I'm hearing. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. OK. Um, simple, quick one. Borrowers used to come into my office and 
sometimes when they would come in, they'd have young kids. And I started to think about it. I'm like, this is a very stressful time for them when they have their child and they have to be worried about whether their child is occupied and going to throw a fit or be tugging on their, you know, on their, on their shirt sleeve. And uh, when they're trying to be focused and present with me on being educated on their financing needs. So I decided we needed to make our conference room kid friendly. So we bought a whole bunch of coloring books. We bought a DVD player and a TV. We had all of the cool, you know, Pixar movies. Uh, we bought some some snacks that were relatively healthy for kids, like string cheese and stuff like that. And whenever uh, whenever somebody would come in with their kids, my office manager Vicky would would ask, you know, would you like me to take your child into the conference room? We have a bunch of games and toys and things like that. And and then the borrower could just kind of settle and and be present with me and know that their kid was being taken care of and the Vicky was making sure that they were having a good time. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And um, I mean, I, I having uh, an eight and a ten year old myself, um, <laughs> you know, I would I would so appreciate that proactiveness that in that anticipatory nature of uh of um you know doing something for the kids to occupy themselves while we handle the the business at hand here and i'll add one thing before you give your next one is that i think that what we're talking about here and it just occurred to me we're talking about empathy yeah. like putting ourselves in the shoes of another and what is it that that person would likely be experiencing? As you said before, very beautifully, it's like, we know, like we're doing this every day. We, we get, if we're doing these surveys, we're getting the feedback that's giving us all the clues we need as to what they might be going through and then evoking empathy and, and, and to the equation of like, okay, let's, let's help them because that's ultimately what are going to give people the feeling and the experience that they're looking for of partnership, as you were saying before. Here's one, here's one uh, of my favorites. Um, sometimes we would see, uh, sometimes we would see survey comments that would call out, quote, the underwriter. Okay. And, 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 uh, and usually that's not in a good way when you're looking at customer surveys in this business. It's like, you know, they were the gatekeeper. They, you know, they caused delays with this. They were too stringent in their requirements. What, whatever the blame is being placed, right? But it would always be, quote, the underwriter. And so I thought, okay, I'm seeing this enough. Thankfully, it wasn't like a ton, but enough that it was like, okay, where are they getting that from? We're obviously putting that in their head. Somebody on the team is putting, is, is finger pointing and saying like, well, you know, my hands are tied. The underwriter needs this, or, um, you know, the underwriter, this, the underwriter, that we're loading their lips with it. Not only that, but I, you know, we talked earlier about demonstrating internal partnership. Like that's not that at all. Instead, we're rolling a under, an underwriter under the bus. We're making them the bad cop. Right. And so we're painting this picture with our borrowers of, um, there is this gatekeeper, there is this police officer whom I, you know, fingers crossed, hope they're having a good day when my loan comes across their desk. And it's this, you know, single person who's, who's going to give it the thumbs up or the thumbs down. That's the picture that we're painting when we use the term, the underwriter, right? So what I invited our staff to do is change the script. Start talking about our underwriting team. When you're talking about the needs of that part of the process, don't ever say the underwriter. Talk about our underwriting team. And it's not a stretch. There's a team and they run stuff by each other. It's the truth. But by positioning it that way, um, we're demonstrating internal partnership. And we're, and we're also demonstrating that like there isn't just one person who, who you know, we're hoping is having a good day and approves your file. Um, this is a team approach, right? So that was that was a that was a way to just sort of you know answer answer that little trend that I was seeing in the survey comments. Could it be even additionally our underwriting team who is, uh, for lack of a better term, um, required to meet or trying to meet our investors' guidelines? Um, because that's even more the truth, right? Like, I mean, an underwriter is not there to be like a, a bad cop. I mean, their job is on the line if they're not adhering to investors' guidelines and that loan gets bought back. But that's really interesting what you're explaining there because I, I, what I love, and I hope that everyone took away from that, 
is that you're kind of even reading between the lines a little bit further because you're seeing this consistent feedback about the underwriter, the underwriter, the underwriter, and then you start asking the question, wait a minute, where are they getting that from? They have to be getting that. Somebody's throwing somebody under the bus here, right? So that's a really good one. Um, all right, I got another one. So I used to own an Italian restaurant, highly successful. We had a concept that was somewhat unique. It was uh, um, kind of gourmet uh, fast serve. So you'd come in and you'd stand in line and you'd look at the menu and then you'd order at the counter and then the food would be out in like 10 minutes because we made fresh pasta and pizza and, and it was super good food. Um, but people weren't used to that that model, right? They, they're, what do you mean I can't sit down first? And then they'd come in and there'd be a long line uh, and they'd be a little bit frustrated by that, even though the line moved really fast. So I started quickly and this was in the first three weeks of being open and we were pumping right away. I'm looking at this from a perspective of proactive to eliminate reactivity. What's the experience that they're having when they're in that line, they're frustrated. How do we eliminate that frustration? So I implemented two things. The first was that I would engage the customers when they were in line. And I would ask them if I could go over the menu with them and the specials. And if I could pair the perfect wine with whatever it is that they're intending to order. And then what I would do is I would go in the back and I'd get them samples of, of two wines that fit into that category, just a little sip. And they would get a little wine tasting while they're waiting in line. So now they're like, they're you know, they're, they're engaged with me. they they're getting a little free wine. And then when the line would start to get near the door and even out the door uh, on a Friday and Saturday night, that's immediately when I would look into the kitchen and say, fire a pizza, they'd fire one. And in two minutes, I'd be out there serving a little slice of pizza to people that are, that are waiting in line because they might have a 10 minute wait. So now they're getting some wine, they're getting some pizza and I'm satisfying their needs and completely turn people around. I mean, that kind of exploded our business because it went from, you know what, I don't like that place because I have to wait in line for 10 minutes to, I love that place because I feel like I'm at somebody's house and I'm eating appetizers and sipping wine while I'm waiting in line. And, and it things just skyrocketed. We turned the negative into a positive. It's like it's like the, there's this wall in front of what you're about to experience in most restaurants when you're made to wait, you're standing outside or you're standing in a lobby and there's they, they don't even give you a menu, which which mm -hmm. I mean, at the very least, like I, I'm, I'm so shocked by that, that like give them something to do and better yet, give them the thing to do that they're going to need to do as soon as they sit down at the table anyway. And it's going to help you turn the table that much faster if they know what they want as soon as they sit down. Give mm -hmm. them a menu, right? But um, I feel like there, what you did is you collapsed the wall. Because on one side of the wall is like, we're waiting for our experience to begin. And then the other side of that wall is like, now we're in it. Now we're experiencing it. And that's what most restaurants are creating. They've got a wall up. Right. Like you, 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 you're lucky to get the time of day from anybody. Servers are zooming by you, bus boys, host, hostesses. They're just all zooming by you. And it's like, you're invisible until you've crossed to the other side of that wall. Right. That's a really good way of putting it. Um, the experience, we, we collapsed the wall and began the experience before they were able to order. That's absolutely right. So how do you do that as an originator? I mean, you know, everything is about creating an experience in my mind. Like that is the name of the game. So it's like going all the way to the first point of contact. My former office manager, Vicki, I mean, we retitled her to, on her business card, to the director of first impressions, because that's the first experience that somebody is going to have of our company is when she answers the phone. And like, how is she answering the phone? And how is she doing that phone transfer? You know, is she just dumping somebody into my voicemail and then they're frustrated because they're like, I thought I was going to get him and his phone rang and I went to voicemail. Did he get up and go to the bathroom? Did he not care about me? I mean, like getting really nuanced with every little step, especially at the beginning, because the beginning is where the where the war is either won with that collapsing of the wall or the wall is made more fortified in many, in many ways, right? Like if you really fumble the ball at the beginning, um, people, you're going to have a hard time overcoming that. Is there anything that, that you would recommend at the beginning of the experience that you would identify that you think is really powerful to implement? Well, I know that you, um, I know that you, cre you know, you created this idea of the brochure. That's the first yeah. thing that comes to mind because what you're doing is you're, um, you're not hiding the fact that you've got this team of people that are going to be 
um, walking you through, guiding you through this process of a loan. And they all specialize in their own area. And oh, by the way, here's a little something about each of them and here's their photo. And yeah, I think that's a, that's a great example of, of, you know, taking that wall down. Well, I mean, I think originators, and now we're kind of getting into marketing a little bit, but I think it's still about partnership. I think originators, in fact, I was on retreat, you know, last week with my leadership 360 group, and there's an originator who you know very well, um, who who uh, is formerly with Apex, who um, was having a little bit of a hard time getting his head around the concept of they need to know you. You know, like like half this battle or half this game is is you being vulnerable enough for them to know who you are, to to like you, not in a voyeuristic perspective. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the ego, you know, beating your chest and all of your awards and your production numbers. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm like I'm talking about who are you? Who's your favorite sports teams? You know, how many kids do you have? You know, what do you like about being a father? Um, I think these things are very, very important to lowering that wall at the onset. And that's what that brochure did um, was allow for connection, which I think is 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 a, is a missing piece in, in a lot of people's cases. Now, you, you've talked about the fact that customers don't go to customer school. Um, what do you mean by that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a favorite little expression. Um, and, and simply it, it, it just means like, um, they don't know how to anticipate their own needs. Uh, this isn't what they do every day. It's what we do every day. So we can't expect them to know the process. And by the way, even if they did it like recently, so, you know, during 2020 and 2021, we, we would have uh, borrowers who uh, would refinance twice within six months, right? It, it wasn't so uncommon. And um, we, I would, I would constantly um, invite our staff to just remember the fact that like, even though they did this six months ago, um, we can't use, we can't use jargon and acronyms with them. We can't expect them to remember. They probably forgot 70% of what they went through because they got their own lives and they've got their own profession and area of expertise and distractions and families. And like, this is all ancient history to them, even if they, even if they did it recently. Um, So we, we need to, um, we need to remember that um, we have an opportunity to demonstrate uh, that that we can and will and do anticipate their needs. I'll give you an example of this. When I was in the, when I was in the car business, um, borrowers, I'm sorry, customers would come in all the time with a trade-in, but they, but they wouldn't bring in their title to their trade-in. A trade-in is no good to us without a title, right? Um, but I would hear, I would hear peers, you know, with the water cooler talk, like, and this is how it usually goes. How can customers be so stupid? How could they not know they needed to bring their title with them? Well, I'm I'm here thinking like, are they stupid or are we stupid for not like alerting them to that before they came in? Like we knew they were coming. We were making an appointment with them. Wasn't their first time here. We knew why they were coming in. We knew they were going to bring in a trade in. Why didn't, so what I started doing at 23 years old was like, okay, what else are they forgetting? They're forgetting their spare keys. They're forgetting the other half of the title in the state of Maryland. You have a, an, another lean, you know, the, the, the lean release if it's if it's been released. Um, and there's a second piece of paperwork for that. They're leaving their easy pass Velcroed to the windshield. They're leaving coins in their coin tray. They're leaving CDs in their CD player changer. They're leaving, um, you know, the list goes on, right? So uh, if we know that most people don't know these things because again, they didn't go to customer school, then like, let's alert them to these things. So back in like, you know, 1995, when everybody had their first AOL account, I would, uh, I would email them the checklist and it went something like, you know, uh, I look forward to meeting with you tomorrow. By the way, here's a list of the things we tend to notice most people, uh, most people leave behind. Um, and, and of course, you know, here's what to expect and we're going to pull your tags off and you're, it's your responsibility to return to the DMV. And here's the phone number for the day. Like anticipate every possible thing because they didn't go to customer school. You know, what you just triggered inside me there is like, if I were originating loans today and I didn't do this back in the day, it's kind of a big miss, but you, you should probably be putting together just a simple checklist of all of the things that you need to remember to do relating to 
entering into your new home, setting up utilities, locating you know, a gardener if it's in a new neighborhood, whatever the case may be, and all of the things that you need to do to bring the previous home to completion because there are things that you need to do there. You know, like, you know, reminders to set up your insurance, you know, determine if you're going to have a home warranty policy as a part of the transaction, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, th there are things that, you know, borrowers are, are forgetting that they have to do. Um, you know, recently I was reviewing my mom's trust, uh, living trust, and with with my trust attorney and there's about six things that my mom didn't do and my father passed away unfortunately that are now problematic but like how is she supposed to know she's not she's in a grieving situation how is she going to remember to create a survivor trust and all of these types of things i mean ideally her trust attorney would have proactively reminded her of that upon my father's passing um it's really really interesting the um like in bringing this down the home stretch. I want to talk about client recovery because I think that this is an area that is truly an art in many ways. Um, you have a pissed off client, you have a pissed off realtor um, that you know is going, that's a valuable relationship for you and it's going sideways. And I and I see originators run for the hills as fast as they can to avoid having to deliver bad news. And I think that what that does is just amplifies the situation dramatically, right? Because the longer that you take to deliver bad news, the more that people start to think, hey, you know, something's up here and it's not, this doesn't seem right. Then they get really agitated. Uh, so I'd love to, I'd love to hear your formula for customer recovery, how to turn an unhappy customer around and, and what are some easy steps to do that? And by the way, the payoff is you end up with um, somebody who's even more, if you do it right, somebody who's now even more loyal to you and more predisposed to send you referrals than if they were just mere, if they were merely satisfied, right? Mm -hmm. If they just had a passive sort of experience, like, again, won't just leave you for something better, we'll leave you for something different. This is a moment of truth. This is a chance to, um, this is a chance to show them what we're made of when something goes sideways. And the good news is there's a there's an easy formula to follow. Not everybody's cut out for this. Not everybody's gonna deliver it in a way that feels genuine. So you, the last thing you wanna do it is put it in some somebody's hands who's gonna um, deliver it in a way that feels disingenuous. But the, the process is, um, it's something that the Ritz-Carlton follows. And um, so if it's the acronym is is last, but if we if we add another letter in there, which is which is key and something you touched on earlier, then the acronym becomes least L E A S T. So um, I'll list it out and then we'll unpack it a little bit. We listen, mm -hmm. we empathize, we apologize, we solve it for them, and we thank it, we thank them for bringing it to us. Mm -hmm. So let's start with the listen part. Um, most people. Most people are just not listened to enough in their lives, right? Um, they don't get it at home. They don't get it at work. Uh, they don't feel heard. So if we can be that person when things have gone sideways, that actually is completely present to what they're sharing with us. Really a great active listener. Repeat back what we've heard. Like that's that's impressive. They're 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 not getting that every day. So that's where it starts. Um, the next piece is empathize. So we're not just we're not just listening, but we're feeling it for them, right? So um, putting ourselves in their shoes, like, wow, that must have been really frustrating for you. If I if I had experienced that, I'd be I'd be really frustrated. Um, I'm sorry you had to endure that. That wasn't that that's not fair that you had to go to go through that. Um, the A is for apologize, and this one's this one um, this one is important that we get it right. A lot of people make the mistake of saying something like, I'm sorry you felt that way, or I'm sorry if we dropped the ball. No, they're telling you you dropped the ball. There is no if, right? So we need to own it. We need to take responsibility for it. And the reason I think that <clears throat> so many people are not great at this is because they hold the idea of an apology as guilt, blame, fault, or shame. Mm -hmm. And nobody wants, nobody wants to feel any of those things. We run from those things right? If we can reframe it instead of guilt, blame, fault, shame, and think of it as responsibility 
and come from that place of like, we let you down. I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry we let you down here. Let's make it right. So we move into the solve part, we make it right. And sometimes that means involving other team members. And I think that to the extent it's possible, we should still own it, not just pass the buck and say, this person's gonna handle it. We need to follow through at least internally, if, if not externally, like with that with that customer by saying, um, you know, I, I know that uh, I got I got the expert on the team involved to help solve this for you. I just wanted to follow up and see how you're feeling now. You know, did did we did we meet that goal? And then uh, the last part is thank them. Um, they could have voted with their feet. They could have been out there spreading negative word of mouth. They could have been bashing us online, and that would have been their outlet, right? But instead, they were brave enough to bring it to us. We need to thank them for that. We need to, we need to, we need to like even say it in, in that kind of a way. Like, you know, if, if you hadn't brought this to me, I don't think I would have known about it. I just, I just regretfully wouldn't have maybe been able to work with you again. And you wouldn't have trusted me with your future referrals um, by sharing it with me. It's like, now we have a chance to fix this and make it right. And I'm grateful for that. Wow, man, that was money. Um, that was <laughs> there was a lot of wisdom in there. Um, thank you. I'm glad I asked you that question and thank you for all of what you shared. Um, yeah, I think that just to add a little color commentary around it, but not much, um, that first part, the listen part is so key because I really loved what you said about the reframing. Um, because I think that if you are holding the feedback as guilt, shame, self-judgment, condemnation of self, et cetera, you're going to want to get the listen part over with as quickly as possible because it's too painful to hear because of how you're holding it. So you're gonna rush to solving or apologizing prematurely. And what is the most important thing in my mind, I mean, my formula was simpler. Yours is much better. I loved everything you said. Mine was first, and I'll say this a little crudely, let them let the air out of the tire. So that requires me to listen, like just listen and let them just share everything, their frustrations, if they're cursing, whatever it is, you got to let the air out of the tire because if you don't, there's no, no chance of recovery. And then the second is to provide, you know, solutions that will help solve the issue for them. Um, but I'm missing steps in there that are key steps in what you answered uh, or what your answer was. I mean, that compassion part is super important. Um, I love the scripting at the end too, Steve, about thanking them and saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm aware of the fact that had I not asked you this and had you not been brave enough to share that um, we wouldn't have an opportunity to be able to fix this and and hopefully work together again and have me, that, that's, I mean, that's money scripting. Um, there's, and there's one more thing that we can add to that. Cause I think this is um, a lot of times the intention of somebody who's, who's shared this feedback with you. Um, you can say, you know what, th now that we know this, um, we're, we're, um, we're grateful to you in another way. And that is we can help prevent this from happening to somebody else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And sometimes that's why they're sharing it with you. Cause they, they're like, they need to know that this is happening. Like um, I had a, uh, I keep bringing up the, uh, the doctor's uh, office uh, um, examples, but there was this thing that happened recently where they wanted to reschedule my appointment. I was leaving for spring break. I, the call comes through that day of like, you need to call our office because he can't see you that day, which was like two months down the line, it takes forever to get in with the specialist. And um, you need to call us back and reschedule. Well, you try to call and reschedule and um, you wait on hold for about 20 minutes and then you hear somebody pick up the phone and hang it up. So how many times are you going to do that? Right. And then, so I did that twice from the airport. And then the next, uh, the next time I called, okay, I'm going to exercise this option of like, you can press two for a call back. So I did that and get, and guess what? Nobody ever called back. <laughs> right. So I, I, I shared all that with the, uh, with the doctor when I finally got in to see him. And his face dropped and he was just so embarrassed. And it just came down to the fact that like, this is never going to change. We just have to have a workaround. Um, you need to call my assistant. Um, and because she's going to answer you, she's going to answer your email, your phone call. But this third party call center, 
they were hired by our parent company. They were the cheapest. And that's why we went with them. And it's, and it's, it's never going to change. Right. So, you know, that's of course the complete opposite, but he received it really well. Um, and he told me the truth, which I was really grateful for. And by the way, the thing that most people do instead of listen, empathize, apologize, solve, and thank the, the thing that most people do is, and you, and you uh, touched on it. They B L I M E. They barely listen. They interrupt and they make excuses. And, yeah. and, and, and for like, where is that bringing any of us? Who's, who is that serving? Right. We've just closed the door to that relationship. Well, I mean, it's a connection business at the end of the day. It always has been and it always will be. And what I don't remember the acronym that you just used, but when you, when you, interrupt and all those types of things, there's no connection occurring between you and the person that is sharing their experience. The antithesis of that, of course, is when you, you know, uh, execute on the first acronym and you you start by listening and you empathize and, you know, um, and on, on all of those other things, I don't remember every word right there, um, is that actually what transpires is a couple of things. Number one is that you as the listener of the experience, is allowing that person to feel heard and seen and that's where connection occurs so you're you are saving we, we have a, a situation where the incident occurred and connection has been severed now we are re-fortifying the connection by hearing them and listening to them and thanking them and then the second piece is that they know that you listening is a vulnerable act because nobody likes to hear complaints about the job their team and they did. But the fact that you're willing to listen and truly empathize with them draws them closer to you because our human nature is, is that we're not mean. We're actually kind by nature, but where we're pissed off, we can come off as unkind. That if you're going to be vulnerable with me, Steve, when I'm sharing with you something that I'm frustrated about, by the time I'm done sharing and you've actually vulnerably listened and thanked me and apologized from an authentic place, I actually just like you now. I'm left with nothing else other than to just like you because you heard me and you showed great bravery to be vulnerable enough to listen. And that brings it right back to where we started of, you know, by, by saying that, like, these are golden opportunities to turn somebody around. They might have just been satisfied, but now they're wowed. Now they're yeah. now they're even more loyal and more likely to refer. Yeah. Steve, it was really a pleasure to spend time with you, man. I uh, I mean, I've gotten to know you a little bit here now that we're working together. Um, and all this conversation did was make me even more excited about uh, the role that you're going to play as head of community in Loan Atlas, uh, because these principles that you're talking about here are going to really benefit our our clients and our members. So thanks for, for being such a great teacher today. And it was really a joy to spend time with you. I really enjoyed the conversation, Tim. Thank you. And I want to say thank you to everyone for, for listening. I hope that you're having a wonderful summer so far. Um, and we're looking forward to the next episode of the 360 Experience. Be well and have a, have a relaxing time with your family at some point in time here this summer. Bye-bye.